It's the Kyle Hyman Show on Redeemer Radio. This is Kyle Hyman, and here to talk about her book that she wrote with Trent Horn. It's called Can a Catholic Be a Socialist? Dr. Catherine Pacolic, thanks for being here. Thanks a lot. Happy to join you. What do you like about economics? Oh, wow. You know, I just walked out of teaching Econ 101, actually. I'm just here with you, fresh off the heels of that. Uh And I think what I love the most about it is the ability to sort of stop and like uh, contemplate the way the world works. I mean, there's all kinds of these sort of natural economic laws built into creation as God revealed it to us. That job of just looking and seeing and observing first, a little bit like the scientists, you know, there's all kinds of fascinating, fascinating things that reveal, I think, the glory of God's creation, you know, with the person, of course, being like at the center of that picture. You know, I could give you a million examples, but it is just kind of exhilarating and, and really enjoyable. How much of it is discovery as in science, where we realize this economic truth versus mm-hmm. kind of understanding human behavior and, and what happens in different situations? Actually, so this is it's a, funny you put it that way. I mean, I think that the posture of The Economist is to start by thinking, how can we understand the world as it's been given to us? But in fact, an enormous part of how the world has been given to us includes our own human nature and how we react in different circumstances. And, you know, I hesitate to use the word, but economists like to think, well, how do human beings react to incentives, you know, to cost and benefits, that kind sure. of thing. But our own nature is part of what's given to us, right? It's not just the so-called external world. So, yeah, studying human behavior is certainly maybe the biggest chunk of what it is that we're up to. So then whenever we're talking about employing these different economic principles, what role Mm -hmm. should or can the church play in economics? Well, so I think this is a great question, and the way that you're putting it is allows me to sort of point back to what I think Pope Leo was up to when he wrote Rerum Novarum as sort of maybe the first or most famous response that the Church made. I do want to point out for your audience that when Pope Leo intervened on matters related to socialism and economics, this was not the first time the Church had thought, you know, hard about things like private property or things like prices. A lots of really fascinating you know, moments in the history of the church and some of the various saints and thinkers. But what is she up to? What is her role? I mean, what Pope Leo said sort of quite frankly was, he said, well, our role to begin with is just to essentially testify to human nature. Hmm. That language that the Vatican Council uses later, or the Second Vatican Council, that the church is an expert in humanity, right? And so what does that mean then by and large? Well, we have, of course, our nature as it's revealed to us and we come to understand it. But it also includes, and I think this is not less important today than it was a hundred years ago, it includes also testifying to the way in which we're fallen and we're subject to things like envy and greed. And right. So there's um, the church sometimes is the only voice saying, hang on a minute, you know, there's great potential. I mean, these are all the things that God gave us the ability to do. They're amazing things, but we're also fallen. And then as fallen creatures, how can the church help? And she, of course, has a lot to say about that. What would be some of the priorities that maybe Catholic social teaching would inform toward what we would emphasize with regards to economics? In terms of what to emphasize, this is always a matter of prudence. Like, what is it that you think people are getting wrong today? You know, so when Pope Leo intervened, he thought, well, people are getting it wrong about possible solutions to the worker problem that he highlighted at that time. So his view of what was prudent to talk about had to do with really weighing in and saying, hey, guys, don't rush headlong in the direction of giving up private property as the socialists want to do. This would be a real violation of human dignity, and it would only hurt the poor. So that was sort of his prudential judgment at that time. Like, this is the thing. Your question to me is kind of like, well, what are the things the church should emphasize? And I think maybe there's not one single right answer to that question. It kind of depends when you look around, you go, what is like really the big mistake out there? When Trent and I got together to write this book, I mean, we certainly felt that sort of there's been this growing interest in socialism, Mm -hmm. which we've seen really very explicitly in the last four years, kind of since the um, 2016 election. Um, And so I think we want, we're both teachers at heart. We both wanted to enter that space and say, hey guys, like it's not a Catholic move to recognize that when people or to argue that because some people have less than others, that what we ought to do is become more socialist. That's not a Catholic move for all these reasons. And so we want to go through that. 
if you look at our very last chapter in that book, that's actually kind of a place where I jump out there and Trent jumps out there. We kind of mention some of the things that I'm most worried about. If I had to say what I think the church should be maybe screaming from the rooftops today, it would be something like, you know, guys, the church has a medicine for all of the things that ails the heart, the human heart. And when I look at the increasing amounts of secularization, the lack of people in line for confession, right? Like fewer people going to the sacraments. I would just expect all of that secularization to have pretty bad effects in the economy because it's not going to work out just the same if we have virtuous people or not virtuous people. So for me, that would be something I would really want to emphasize together with this kind of reiteration of the historic position of the church, which is socialism isn't the answer. We're talking with Dr. Catherine Pekalik, and the book is Can a Catholic Be a Socialist? And I think she's given away the punchline here. And it's it's okay. It's, it's on the front of the book as well. The answer is no. Here's why. And maybe we should start by defining what yeah. is socialism. And is there a distinction between socialism as an economic system versus like socialist policies that might be applied within another economic system or these inseparable or, you know, in some sense, the answer is yes, and the answer is also no. I mean, okay. I mean, this is tricky. I mean, I would also say, like, in part, as someone who really absolutely loves theology and philosophy very, very deeply, I would like to say that those are usually the sort of the most fundamental debates. <laughs> but I actually think economics is right in there as sort of areas where things become very, very muddled very quickly. Huh. But yeah, look, classical socialism, as the popes who were first weighing in on the subject, classical socialism involved both... Um, you know, certain aggressive and maybe less aggressive forms of the confiscation of private property, right? So you could just kind of go in and seize farms from people, for instance, is a very clear form of classic socialism. Typically, classic socialism also included the widespread nationalization of industry, right? So the means of production are owned by the state and also private property is confiscated. Hmm. Now, into the 20th century, we've seen all kinds of sort of hybrid versions of that. And we've seen an attempt to maybe soften it by saying, well, there could be sort of democratic forms of socialism. And even, to be perfectly honest, we have folks calling themselves socialists who don't advocate for either one of those two things, who don't advocate for, say, the nationalization of whole industries, and who don't advocate for the confiscation of private property, but who simply want to see more of the ordinary functions of human life taken on as functions of the state, if you will. So, you know, health care and education and things like that. And a lot of times, um, you know, and how do you pay for that? How does the state take on those functions right. by very high levels of taxation? And a lot of times that gets called socialism as well, right? So mm -hmm. that's a little bit of a difficulty when we think about defining terms here. Yeah, I guess how much of people that are supporting socialism or, or saying that they're advocating for that really understand what they're saying because i certainly went before you know kind of getting right. this crash course yeah yeah i mean i think that definitely some of the data we present at the very beginning of the book we kind of point out you can find widespread numbers of young people for instance who say that they're in favor of a socialist candidate or they want more socialism so obviously there's a lot of misunderstanding about what these terms mean and how they're used you know the church if she's got any job at all. Her job is to stand for truth and to sort of try to mm -hmm. gently point people in the direction of reason, like to stop and think and to define terms. I mean, but it's certainly worthwhile pointing out that there are some things which have flown under the heading of, say, democratic socialism, which are not necessarily evil in themselves, okay. in the way that the Pope said that the confiscation of property is evil in itself. Okay. And the nationalization of industries in this classical sense is evil in itself, because this is not the function of government. <laughs> and actually, you know, many of the popes point out, we're not against the government. In fact, what we're concerned about is if the government tries to take on too many jobs, that her own health and life will be imperiled. So this isn't an issue of we hate the government, but actually let's concern ourselves with the health of the government. And the government can't be healthy if she's taking on too much work. Um, you know, Pope Benedict said something like, you know, certain flavors of democratic socialism have done some good. It wasn't an unabashed recommendation that, you know, we should fly the flag of democratic socialism, but he was kind of recognizing these are not necessarily things that are evil in themselves. And in fact, they might even raise our awareness about certain problems. It could be more progressive or left-leaning candidates who raise awareness about things that are truly things that we should care about. 
But I think as a matter of prudence, like if it's me, I'm going to say, again, it's not a Catholic move. It might be a Catholic move to be concerned about the problem. And we may even thank our democratic socialist friends for raising a problem. We ought to have seen it first. We as Christians ought to have seen this problem first. But we don't need to solve it with these sorts of socialist policies. We have other approaches. In fact, the best approach, right, is to double down on what it is at the core of our faith, because if it's not the job of the state, it definitely is the job of Christians. Can you maybe give us an example yeah. of something, whether it be, I don't know, health care for all or some of these yeah. things that we get thrown yeah. around a lot, the, maybe one of the traps, because it looks good on surface and it sounds like it'd be a good yeah. thing that Catholics would get behind. What are some of the yeah. traps that we should be aware of? a couple of traps. I mean, I think that, um, I think the one that is probably easiest to describe quickly is something that we think about with education. And it's something that probably we're not even thinking very hard about. We live in a country where, you know, roughly 95% of the students in this country are attending public schools. This is in a sense, a kind of socialized system, right? It's, it's, you know, I'm not going to say it's socialist, but I'm going to say it's socialized. It's a nationalized industry at schools, right? Well, I mean, if you kind of dig back into the thought of, you know, Leo the Thirteenth and Pope Pius XI, they were kind of saying, you know, look, I mean, the problem is the child is not a child of the state. The child is a child of the family and the church, actually. Those are the two families to which the child belongs. And so I think some of the concerns would be not merely can you transmit skills or can you kind of like distribute a certain, like if you think about in the case of social welfare, can you distribute calories to people? Can you make sure people can merely read? It's not the full question. The church always thinks about, which he uses the term, like integral human development. Is the child loved? Does the child feel loved at school? And if the child feels loved, is it easier to perhaps teach math and reading and writing? And probably the answer is yes, right? Because a certain level of stress is reduced and I guess I would put it that way, or like we think about the difference between receiving health care in an institutionalized setting versus receiving health care from your mom <laughs> or your nurse. The instinct of the church is always that the someone who is caring for you is standing in for who could be your mom, right? Who could be like your sister. We, we call nuns sisters mm-hmm. because they could be my sister. She's my sister in Christ. <laughs> we don't think that the state or that institutions or even that firm are generally capable of embodying the love of Jesus Christ in that way. I think that's the thing we have to be worried about. But it's like we don't even have to get there, what it looks like to be the case. I mean, certainly if we size up the nationalized education system right now, we are seeing state by state levels of proficiency for 8th graders and 12th graders that would just make your head explode. You think, well, how could your nationalized industry be getting it this bad? You know, 20%, 15%, percent of proficiency, right? This isn't, we're, we're doing a great job with 85% of the kids and then 15%. 85% of the kids aren't proficient. The church isn't going to offer like, well, here's how we fix this problem, but she's going to point us in the direction of saying, hey, you know, let's scratch our heads here. Maybe there's something wrong with doing this in a nationalized way. Maybe, maybe there's, you know, very fundamental problems related to human nature and how children need to feel, you know, cared for and how we do care as a community that could be re-examined. Again, the church is going to raise the question. She isn't necessarily going to provide you sort of the policy solution. Is that helpful? Yeah. Um, there, there's so much more that we could get into here, and yeah, I have so many more yeah. questions, but people will just have to get the book yeah. so they can uh, get a more thorough answer to a lot of these questions. So where should we send people to get a copy? Well, I would like to send you to Amazon. It's very easy for most people, although as of this morning, Amazon was sold out. Um, oh. Definitely Catholic.com, right? Um, the, the website of Catholic Answers uh, can always be ordered there. I understand that Amazon will be restocked very shortly, so you can go ahead and order there if that's your preferred vendor. But um, Catholic.com, it's, I think it's a good read. I'm, I'm, I want to give a shout out to my co-author. I think Trent, you know, Trent did a fantastic job with this. And I've rarely worked with someone who isn't an economist who has... <laughs> such a fine mastery of the concept so it was really a pleasure start to finish yeah it's called can a catholic be a socialist and the answer is no here's why but uh trent (laughs) horn and dr Catherine pacolic are the authors check it out it's a it's really i think a a good one especially if you're having these debates and discussions with friends and family that's it or or if you have some of these struggles yourself and you're and you're kind of feeling like there's a lot of good things about socialism check out Mm -hmm. the book can a catholic be socialist thank you so much dr Catherine pacolic for sharing it with us today welcome thanks for having me kyle